Good evening. How are you? Good. Wanga Megan Shukshak Alvan Stimple, Oguva Milhurunga, Sidnasak Milhurunga. I'm here with Kuerk and we're honored that you you can all join us today. Uh, I'm gonna we're gonna kick off this dialogue with Senator Sullivan and his wife Julie. Are you guys here? We're here. Thank you, Senator. We're we're so glad you're here. Uh, Senator Sul Dan Sullivan is our senator from Alaska, and he's spearheaded this uh, issue of ivory in the Senate and is our champion in protecting our, our way of life. So we're honored that he's here, and uh, please welcome Senator Sullivan. Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is a great turnout. Boy, I am so excited. Thank you everybody for coming to this, all my Alaskan uh, colleagues and constituents, Melanie, the whole team, Megan, Gail, uh, Vera, this is gonna be a very, very important and exciting round table that we're all glad that you're here to uh, help us support and help us learn, right? This is, this is a classic example this is like an informal hearing here in the Senate. This is about education, education, education. And I can't thank my Alaskan, fellow Alaskans for uh, coming. You know, we have to travel a little bit further than most states, uh, with all due respect to Connecticut and Virginia and those guys. Uh, so they've literally traveled thousands of miles to be here for something that we think is really important. And I think, and I honestly believe this, something that most um, members of the Senate, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, senator, staff, we know there's a lot of uh, members, staffs here, um, that all of you think is important as well. So um, we wanna thank you. It's not just uh, members, staffs, um, but there's a lot of companies here who are here to learn and we're very, very excited about that. Um, Megan mentioned my wife Julie's here. I always take, take the chance to, you know, uh, suck up to my wife and uh, introduce her. So there's my wife, uh, who's uh, an Alaska native herself. And I, I, before we, we start off, um, you know, one of the best parts of today is going to be the reception that we hold uh, after this. It's just upstairs. And for all the Alaskans and invited guests, you will literally get the best seafood, Alaskan crab, uh, bearing uh, from the Norton Sound region, and halibut, you'll love it. It's free, and we're gonna have a good time at that as well. So I'm looking forward to, to that and being with all of you uh, at that this evening, or after this event. So um, what are we here for? Well, I think a lot of you know that um, we have a beautiful Alaska Native culture in our state. It's not just beautiful for Alaska, it's beautiful for America, it's beautiful for the world, to be perfectly honest. And uh, a lot of that involves a subsistence lifestyle and subsistence culture, and it also involves heritage that dates back thousands and thousands of years, which we respect. And there are elements to that that I think are not always understood uh, in the lower 48 throughout the rest of the world, and that's what this is about. So one of the most important things that happen in many communities is a wonderful, sustainable art. You're gonna hear all about this beautiful ivory art that we have, and we have been, our Alaska Native communities have been producing for generations, literally for thousands of years. And yet, sadly, and again, I think it's well-intentioned, this is not an event that's uh, attacking anybody, but sadly, there has been uh, the threat of this way of life and this culture and this beautiful art that has been coming under threat through numerous states banning the sale of sustainable arts out of walrus and mammoth ivory and other marine mammal products that, and this is the key, and this is all part of the education, that are completely legal. Let me repeat, completely legal under federal law. And so what we wanna do is talk about this, 
Many of these bands that you're starting to see from different states, as I mentioned, I believe are well-intentioned because they're almost all focused on the illegal trade of African elephant ivory, which is illegal. So we have no issue with that. We don't want trade in these beautiful African elephant species, many of which are endangered. So that is illegal internationally in America. We accept that, we agree with that 110%. But prior to the federal ban on elephant ivory, so that's illegal federally, um, there's been a number of states that have been adopting bans on all ivory. And again, I think it's well-intentioned. I've talked to many of these officials but what's happening is you are taking the lifestyle and culture and, importantly, the economic and monetary uh, engine of growth and opportunity in a lot of smaller communities in Alaska, and we're sh that's being shut down because of these uh, well-intentioned but misapplied state bans on all ivory, including Alaskan walrus ivory. So the point of us being here today is to just have people learn about this in a much more deep way. So I really appreciate, this is a great turnout. I really appreciate the um, turnout of the staffs of senators, which is really, really important. Um, Senator Murkowski and Congressman Young, of course, have been very focused on this issue. For example, we wrote the uh, National Conference of State Legislators and National Governors Association last year to all state legislators and governors, Democrat, Republican, again, just trying to educate and say, we get it, we understand what your bands are trying to do with regard to the African elephant and its ivory, but the impact you are having on legally harvested and produced Alaskan ivory uh, is something that's very negative, and we don't think you really want to do so that's what we're trying to do. And last year, uh, I had a bill that would um, ensure that it was called the Empowering Rural Economies Through Alaska Native Sustainable Arts and Handicrafts Act. If you're looking for like an interesting acronym that came out of that a naming of that bill, you're not going to find it. It's just um, that's the name of the bill because we're trying to be accurate on what it does. But what we're trying to do is make sure that the bans that happen uh, in the states don't cover what is federally um, allowed under the law. So, for example, two years ago, uh, I hosted a uh, chaired an environment and public works committee in Alaska on the margins of uh, the Alaska Federation of Natives annual conference in our state. We had a great turnout, we had many artisans, but importantly, we had the Obama administration, senior officials, and uh, important national wildlife organizations testify at this hearing, all of whom said, this is completely legal, and we shouldn't be banning it. This is President Obama's uh, administration, and the Trump administration is in the same position. So what we're hoping we can accomplish today is a better understanding um, of what this issue is all about, what the origins of this issue are, and hopefully, uh, I've already introduced my bill again in this Congress. Again, it got passed out of Commerce Committee last year, bipartisan. Uh, we didn't have time to move it on the floor. But so when we do that again this year, that we have the full support of Democrats and Republicans, and hopefully states, and hopefully the private sector, to understand just how unique Alaska is, how important this is, and how this is an issue that from the federal government's perspective, whether it was the Obama administration or the Trump administration, this is completely legal to do. Can't emphasize that enough. So again, I wanna thank um, all my fellow Alaskans for here, uh, who are here. Melanie is gonna kick off our first panel. Uh, Vera Medcalf is gonna kick off our second panel with uh, federal officials. Uh, we're very excited. I'm going to try and stay as long as I can for this. Um, I thank you again for the attendance at this important meeting. We look forward to hearing and taking questions here and then having a more informal 
uh, gathering a little bit uh, later this afternoon um, upstairs. But um, this is a really important issue to Alaska. It's a really important issue to our Native community. I would say it's a really important issue to America. These, these cultures, our cultures, this is what makes our state and our country great, this kind of diversity. And we want to make sure it's empowered, not um, undermined. And so that's what we're all here about. So Melanie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you again for being here. Megan, the whole team, um, I look forward to an enlightening session in the next hour. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. <clears throat> and I know that you might not be able to stay for the whole event. So before you do leave, um, on behalf of Coeric and Bering Straits Native Corporation, we have a present for you for being such a champion for our Alaska Native art. Um, this piece here at the end is yours to have. So um, make sure that somebody or you're welcome to pick it up right now if you'd like, yes. Yes, that is yours from Coeric and Bering Straits Native Corporation. We're so grateful that you've been um, championing, championing our, protecting our way of life. Thank you. Um, I want to welcome everybody and encourage you to, uh, there's a few more seats left for those of you in the back. It's always like church. Nobody likes to sit in the front row. Um, but there are a few more seats if you want to come on up and have a seat. I want to welcome you to our event, Ayvuk Nangal Nakhbut, Walrus and Our Way of Life. And before I kick off with a panel, um, we have a short video that we'd like to share with you that um, helps illustrate some of the points that we're trying to bring um, to you today. So Naina, if you wouldn't mind playing that video. very old, uh, before Christ. We dig these up with uh, hand shovels, old uh, ancestral grounds. And uh, you can tell the design on them. These are all handcrafted by my, uh, my ancestors. I am Jason Aya, and I'm from Sabunga, Alaska. Sabunga is in between Alaska and Russia, uh, St. Lawrence Island, very remote island considered the land bridge. I was born in Nome and raised here on St. Lawrence Island. Followed uh, cultural and traditional ways in um, subsistence hunting and uh, subsistence digging and subsistence artwork. It's been a part of my life, all my life. <laughs> I first started making artwork when I would believe in my early teens. I was influenced by my father, watching him carve. Other artists were doing it as well, and um, that inspired me, you know. I do transformation art. Transformation art has always been around because of my uh, ancestors, the Akvik era. They were before Christ, and um, there's dolls that they made that are a transformation between uh, man and animal, like uh, spiritual transformation. It's a walrus man. He's transforming into this uh, guardian for the walrus. It's just a big step, you know, from my ancestors to me, today's society and market. The market, it's not decreasing, but it's uh, growing. Being on the internet at my mom's is uh, slow, and uh, even though it is slow, it's available as long as the weather is cooperating. If there was a better connectivity, that would that would really benefit a uh, community of artists. And they are trying to find uh, venues and markets and people that do appreciate and love uh, artwork. Was um, a local artist from my hometown of Savunga. I'm a Kekukak, that's my Yupik name, and um, I was raised on the on St. Lawrence Island in Savunga, and our family relied and still relies heavily on walrus. Um, we eat a lot of our traditional foods. Um, 
I wish I could bring you all there so that you could see firsthand how we live and how we rely on walrus. And we um, try to make as much use of all of the parts of the walrus, um, including the ivory. So again, I'm just really honored to be here today. We're um, grateful for the wonderful turnout. Sincere thanks to Senator Sullivan and his staff. Um, we also had some sponsors supporting us, um, Bering Straits Native Corporation, Norton Sound Economic Development Corporation, Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, and the Rasmussen Foundation in Alaska helped us to put on this educational event. Our region in Alaska, the Bering Strait region, is well known for diversity in Alaska Native culture. We have St. Lawrence Island Yupik, Central Yupik, and Inupiaq communities. Our communities are home to Alaska Native hunters and ivory carvers, our cultural bearers and living artists. Ivory carving is a tradition that has been passed down from generation to generation, and it reflects the customary and traditional use of walrus ivory. Our art provides the means for a basic living and often is the sole source of cash income for many families in our region. We've relied on the land, air, and sea to sustain us for thousands of years, and ivory bands are inconsistent with the Marine Mammal Protection Act and they harm our way of life. The Marine Mammal Protection Act respects our right to hunt walrus for subsistence purposes and also protects our ability to create and sell authentic Alaska Native handicraft, which may be sold in interstate commerce. The individual state bans are having a negative impact on our people. We were the original, and we still are the original conservationists. There is no population that has a greater interest in ensuring that the walrus population is healthy besides Alaska Natives, because that is our soul. It's, it's such a staple in our diet. It um, sustains us and has for thousands of years. So we're the original conservationists, and we don't want any threats to the walrus population. The walrus population is healthy. The Pacific walrus population is healthy. We're not a user, user of our ecosystem. We've been there for thousands of years. And having a healthy ecosystem and having a good balance in the ecosystem um, involves us because we're a part of that ecosystem. We're not just a user of it. We've been in our part of the world for thousands of years. And the irony is not lost on me that the original Americans, Alaska Natives, and our expression, our ability to express our culture and to nurture it and ensure that it carries on is now being criminalized. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. I want you to hear firsthand from our men here um, from our region who actually are hunters, they're providers, they provide for their families, and they also create beautiful Alaska Native art as an expression of our culture. So I'd like you to hear directly from them um, and we'll start with Itigunak, who's also from Savunga, my hometown, Perry Pangawi. Um, Perry, if you could share with us how your family relies on ivory and how the bands are having an impact on you. Thank you. It's up to you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm also from Savunga. My name is Perry Pangawi. And... Um, I was raised harvesting walrus my whole life. And the first um, rules were to respect the animals, to share. And the way we respected the animals was to store it properly and to share with the unfortunate, you know, or the widowed, the elderly. In our hometown in Sivunga, we harvest as a community. We work together as a team. There's, you know, it, it's a community event. And we help each other, we keep an eye on each other. And for my crew, we probably feed about five families. <clears throat> Along with elders, you know that there'll, there'll be people that ask, you know, did you get anything? So we'll gladly share. And 
all the food and the ivory that we harvest is shared equally among my crew members. A lot of times that sale of the ivory will determine whether we are able to go out and harvest more walrus. So it, it goes hand in hand. The present dangers right now, uh, have you, uh, if you've heard the uh, shrinking of the ice sheets and stuff like that, we're adapting to that, and so is the walrus. Because of the ice, lack of sea ice, it's becoming more dangerous to be out there in the open. The ice acts as a shelter from the wind and the waves. And closing it out would be each piece of artwork right here fed how many families and it's the sale of it will also feed the families because the cost of living in our villages is uh, phenomenal. We'd rather get our own food than go to a grocery store when we have no money, you know. We're trained to harvest our own, so that's what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Perry. Um, next, I'd like to ask um, Sylvester Ayak, who's a um, world-renowned artist and is originally from King Island. If you could share your perspective on the importance of walrus and ivory and how the bands are having an impact on our communities. Thank you. I was uh, born and raised in King Island a um, long time ago. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, we didn't even know how to speak English. Only when we um, were relocated or forced to move out of our island did we learn how to uh, speak it a little, enough to be understood. And uh, that's how it is for me, you know. So uh, bear with me, you know, if I should stumble on my English, you know, and uh, which is often uh, when I try to share. But anyway, um, I I grew up in a time, you know, when um, all the traditional culture was uh, old school way. We use skin boats and tools and implements uh, made, a lot of it made uh, with ivory. So today, um, ivory is still very important in the villages um, surrounding uh, Norton Sound and Northern Bering Sea, and uh, where very little cash is being made um, or employment is uh, uh, far in between to supplement uh, their cash income. Uh, we have carvers like um, uh, Perry and myself who depend on um, uh, ivory carving for a uh, little income, you know, that we uh, get from selling it. And banning it, banning um, uh, ivory trade would really affect... Um, many people in our region. So it is very important, you know, uh, uh, for us to uh, keep using ivory uh, as a, a source of income. And um, um, and for me, you know, um, uh, we were forced, forced out of our island around 1963 or 64. Uh, and all the families from King Island were moved to Nome on mainland. And um, it was uh, one of the very difficult uh, times for all of us. We had to adjust new way of life on mainland. 
that we didn't we knew very little of but uh, somehow we uh, as a community uh, supporting each other i think you know we made a um, uh, adjustment very well and today you know um, we still uh, go out hunting for uh, walrus seals and whatever is uh, available in our region uh, in northern bering sea um, you know what we can bring home you know to feed our families and like um, a pair is shared, you know, that um, everything we bring home is shared with the um, uh, people in the, in the village or community. And in my case, um, I send a lot of uh, what I bring home to Anchorage, uh, to another big family there of King Island, uh, King Island people. And um, uh, so, it's very seasonal. Our biggest challenge today, too, is a, um, a, a climate change caused by global warming. The um, sea ice is uh, getting thinner and forms uh, later in fall time and uh, disappears earlier in springtime. So, our challenges um, still exist today for us in that way, uh, for the hunters, you know. And um, this year has been a um, one of the best seasons I've seen out of Nome. And um, many of the hunters uh, were blessed to bring home um, a lot of our seals and and uh, what was um, uh, what was passing through the ice pack and um, uh, and I grew up um, carving ivory learning how to carve ivory you know when I was very young and I did that for um, many many years probably at least 40 years until I got burned out with uh, carving ivory you know and I switched to uh, something you know that of my interest you know for a long time is uh, more modern art using different materials. And uh, today, you know, um, I like the challenges of uh, these projects, you know, that I, that I do in Alaska. And um, if only I can uh, graduate into um, doing artwork in uh, 500 feet high and 500 feet wide, you know, uh, I would um, have uh, done uh, my wish, you know, uh, all along. And uh, there's nothing wrong with the uh, carving ivory, you know, for those, you know, who are, who depend on it for income. And it's been a, a long haul for me, you know. I, I feel blessed, you know, that uh, ivory carving took care of me, you know, when nobody else would. And for that, you know, um, I have nothing but gratitude. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Sylvester. You're welcome. Um, next, I'm going to ask Ben Payena, who's also on CoWork's Board of Directors and is a hunter and an artist and a father. In fact, this piece that you're looking at down here is something that Ben created, so that's uh, an example of the artwork that he's able to create. Ben, if you could share your perspective on why walrus and ivory is important to you and your family and your community and how the bands are impacting you. Sure. Um, my name is Benjamin Payana Adat, for those of you who don't know me. I was fortunate enough to start boating and hunting at a very young age. Um, I think my, first, my father was born and raised on King Island, much like Sylvester. Um, my first trip out there, I was about six weeks old. and. Uh, Traveling out to King Island, we have to do it in an 18-foot Lund boat. So it's just a small skiff. It has to be something that's small enough and light enough that we can still haul it up on the rocks when we go there. But we travel out there every year for walrus hunting. So I was six, six weeks old, my first trip out there. I started hunting walrus when I was about five. I was able to harvest my first walrus when I was seven. I still have a lot of memories as a kid traveling through the ice pack and traveling through the herds of walrus, 
seeing and hearing the walrus from the houses on King Island. Um, I started carving probably when I was about eight or nine years old. Uh, my dad made his living. He um, made his living by carving. That was his only income, really. And so we always had to rely on the spring hunting seasons. Um, I grew up in that lifestyle. It, it has been a huge part of my life. It, it's very important to me. Um, I remember in high school, one of my first jobs, a lot of people start working at the grocery store or something like that. One of my first incomes really was from ivory carving. We had a class called Art and Culture, and it allowed us to carve for about an hour out of each day. So that was one of my first jobs really was ivory carving. And a lot of my carving, a lot of my income would go right back into hunting supplies, buying gas. I remember carving specifically to get gas for our trips to King Island because it meant so much to me to get out there. Uh, I've actually run my own boat, have my own hunting crew since I was 18. So I've been hunting walrus for almost 30 years now, I guess. It's been a while. Um, I'm not sure what else to add in there. Have you seen any impact on your ability to sell ivory since your states have enacted the ban? It does seem harder to find buyers, yeah. It doesn't seem like there's a strong enough market like there was in years past. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your perspective, Ben. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and um, transition into our next um, group of people that are going to speak about the management and health of the walrus population. And I'd like to invite Vera Metcalf, um, who is the director of the Eskimo Walrus Commission in Alaska, to come up and talk about um, walrus, our way of life, the sustainability of the population, and how we manage the population. Thank you, Vera. Well, I'm, I'm Vera Metcalf. I'm born and raised in Savunga on St. Lawrence Island. I'm a Kiwalmi, Melanie is Kiwalmi, and pa Perry is a Kiwalmi. We're organized into clans out on St. Lawrence Island, so we're well represented here from the Kiwalmi clan. But um, I uh, live in Nome. I have been with the Walrus Commission since 2002, uh, a female working in a male environment. Uh, most of the hunters are men. Um, and um, Eskimo Walrus Commission is a co-management organization that uh, represents uh, 19 communities all along the coast from uh, Bristol Bay down south, way up north to um, Point Barrow. So it covers Bristol Bay, uh, the Bering Sea, and the Chukchi Sea. So it's a large uh, range, uh, 19 uh, coastal communities. My comments are from my personal experiences, uh, reflections, and based on what I've learned from my family. We're uh, very uh, family-oriented in Savunga, born and raised in Savunga. And from my work through the years in cultural um, and language documentation, St. Lawrence Island, Yupik is my first language, English is my second. And working for many, many years with a lot of governmental agencies and managers and um, researchers. Uh, Pacific walrus is a, a single stock um, whose population is estimated at 283,213. Um, Steve, I'm sure, will cover more on that as determined by Fish and Wildlife Service. So we have a co-management agreement with Fish and Wildlife Service to manage this resource. And, um, and they've collaborated with Russian partners in determining the population size. Uh, and of course, working with uh, Alaska Native communities in many of the coastal communities. In recent years, uh, uh, the total harvest of Walrus averages 
under 4,000. So we have, um, this is a shared resource between US and Russia. So Chukotka uh, neighbors harvest about 1,300. And of the Alaska native harvest, uh, approximately 80% are taken by the two communities on St. Lawrence Island. And it shows you the, the graph there. Uh, shoot up in the middle is uh, because of commercial uh, har harvest back in, the, back in those years. But um, Savugan Gamble, yes, 80%. So this is uh, taken from the native village of Gamble, that's Chukotka, the mountains. We see them every day there in Gamble, but that's how close it is. Um, so it's a shared resource between US and Russia. And they worry about the same things like we do in Alaska, about their ability to harvest uh, marine mammals like walrus. So um, it's very important to know that in Savungan Gamble, um, we have approved uh, what we call the Tribal Marine Mammal Ordinances, which are based on traditional um, management principles that are approved by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and very consistent with MMPA. And, um, and it's um, endorsed by the Fish and Wildlife Service's law enforcement. So it's working well because it's traditional resource management of, of walrus. The annual harvest represents less than 2% of the most recent population estimate, a harvest rate that is considered sustainable by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It is sustainable, and the population is considered very healthy right now. All EWC communities consider Conservation of the walrus population, its most important responsibility. As evidenced by resolutions concerning walrus haul-out, um, protections have been point laid. They're very good at uh, protecting walruses when they're hauled out in large, large numbers. And other environmental concerns um, affecting our environment. Um, Melanie mentioned MMPA. Uh, it allows for the harvest of Pacific walrus for Alaska Native coastal residents because it is and has been for thousands of years. I mean, this gentleman said it in many different ways. And it is a cultural, uh, nutritional, and very important natural resource to us. So utilizing all the resources from the harvest of Marine and all wildlife are also fundamental to the cultural values of Alaska Native people. If the use and value of walrus ivory is generally outlawed and becomes useless, Alaska Native hunters like Ben, Sylvester, Perry, will struggle with conflicting values of cultural respect for our marine mammals and Western regulations often imposed on us, like the ivory ban that we are currently dealing with. These laws are direct violation of MMPA and the passing of state legislations carries another burden uh, for the potential um, long-term and devastating impact on the legal ivory market. Uh, very similar to what happened with uh, uh, the seal ban in the European Union. So this is just some of the work that my nephews have done. And it's beautiful. It's amazing. They're very creative. And this is what they do. They, they're very proud of their work. And I would like to end with this comment. Um, Winifred James Rulu, uh, his name, was from Gamble. And I always like that ending where he told us never to give up. So that's why we're here. You know, we're, we're fighting for what's legally an inherent right for us as Alaska Natives.
Thank you, Kaka. Um, Vera mentioned that she's been working in this male-dominated field for decades now, but we also do have female artists out there. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't bring everybody with us, but there are um, women who also create this beautiful art. Uh, Susie Siluk is an example. Um, she's got pieces all over the country. She carves beautiful art, and I'm trying to come up with a good analogy for those of you to understand what banning our art means for us. So I, I guess the closest thing is everybody likes music. You've got your favorite song. Um, it makes your soul sing. For us, it's our Alaska Native um, artwork. And can you imagine a world without music? Because that's how it would feel for us if our artwork is banned. Um, I'd like to invite Steve Wachowski up here next. Um, Steve is the Senior Advisor for Alaskan Affairs under Secretary Bernhardt. And he's going to talk about the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service jurisdiction over the walrus species and the health of the population and co-management. Steve? Thank you, Melanie. <clears throat> I'm Steve Wachowski, Senior Advisor for Alaskan Affairs at the Department of Interior. I've actually got the best job in the Trump administration. I get to live at home. and. Uh, fight for the people that I care about and love. Uh, um, I'd just like to point out, thanks to Senator Stevens and to Megan and to Melanie for inviting me here. There's just, my list of, is short of people that would force me to spend an extra weekend in DC to be here, and um, I, I was happy to oblige. Uh, I know we tried to get Secretary Bernhardt and Secretary Sweeney here. Um, they are both, unfortunately, out of DC. Um, Tara, uh, Tara, Secretary Sweeney, is uh, at the uh, Missing and Indigenous Women's Conference in Arizona, and then uh, Secretary Bernhardt um, has an event with the Vice President in uh, Wyoming and Montana. Um, Melanie, we met last year. We took Secretary, then Deputy Secretary Bernhardt, Art, Bernhardt out to Nome uh, with uh, Assistant Secretary Baylash. And uh, the Secretary wanted to see the prime example of great co-management and at the top of my list was EWC. We are very proud to work with the community, and this is an area where the feds can actually give up some power and authority and let this be managed by Alaska's first people. And uh, that's where we actually tend to get the least amount of problems when we have local people with skin in the game making the decisions. And that was a model he wanted to look at. In fact, uh, we're taking steps to try to expand that model into other areas of uh, co-management without the state, everywhere from subsistence uh, to other marine mammals. Uh, I'm just going to hit on two things briefly. Vera did a great job of covering some of what I was going to talk about, uh, the health of the population and the stocks. Uh, before I forget, I was told by Melanie, because Senator Sullivan is here, I'm sorry, by Megan, to mention funding. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to get it crosswise with OMB, um, but year to year we average about anywhere from $164,000 to $250,000 a year where we're able to send to the EWC. Um, resources are still tight in this era of CRs. It's hard to get. We don't have a direct line item budget, but that's something we're working on getting is trying to get some of these codified into, into the um, appropriations process. Um, I think it's, I kind of smile. I'm fairly new to the interior. I've now been on board for two years. Um, I think it's important for us to all note that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are newcomers to managing walrus and managing the environment. Uh, Alaska's first people, our, our brothers and sisters up north, have been managing this for millennia. And um, we bring a lot of Western science to bear, a lot of survey work, but some of our best um, science comes from traditional knowledge. And that is an area where we at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Department of Interior as a whole are trying to better and increase our integration of traditional knowledge into uh, the decisions we have to make, our NEPA work. It's absolutely critical. Um, it's an honor and we're honored to uh, manage uh, walrus with the EWC and these uh, wonderful communities. I want to hit real quickly on the Alaska uh, or I'm sorry, the Indi uh, Indian Arts and Crafts Board and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service law enforcement uh, perspective. Uh, 
the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Office of Law Enforcement um, assisted in the uh, Indian Arts and Crafts Board publication of Alaska Native I Ivory pamphlets. I brought, um, I have a mock-up of it, and then behind you on the table, we've got several of our brochures and calendars. Uh, we've worked with the Indian Arts and Crafts Boards to host a booth at the Alaska Federation of Natives. We post um, advertisements in tourist magazines encouraging people to buy local. We've got a special brand, and you can see pictures on there of Made in Alaska by, I don't know if you can hold, it's behind you. I know it's against Senate rules, sorry Pierce. The other one down there that's flipped over. You'll see a little logo that identifies uh, authentic Alaska Native art. And we've got this, uh, again, in pamphlets on the back, and please, uh, by all means, take it back and take it to your members. Um, so we've also posted ads in tourist magazines, as I discussed, and then we have an active business directory listing on our website uh, for authentic Alaska Native art. That brings me to our next uh, topic of law enforcement. I brought with me here a uh, fossilized uh, walrus tusk, and this was actually a confiscated piece from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, or sorry, not, for, not fossilized. Um, a confiscated piece from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that came out of the Toyak Refuge in 1990. This was intercepted in Anchorage uh, from someone who was trying to smuggle it. And we use this, it's actually on display in the Deputy Secretary's office uh, for educational purposes on some of the important facets of our Fish and Wildlife Service law enforcement. I did want to highlight, um, sorry, no. You can pick it up too, it's pretty heavy. Just, I signed for it, so they told me don't let it leave my sight. It's worth several thousands of dollars. Um, We're bringing it home with us. I <laughs> I'll let you sign for it and then. Uh, so we have uh, just recently took the first enforcement action where um, Fish and Wildlife Service law enforcement um, busted a downtown Anchorage tourist shop that was selling fake Alaska Native artwork. I tried to talk them into letting me go and do an undercover buy, but um, they, didn't, they thought I was too high profile to do that. Um, so I'm still working on it. And then the next big piece of news is we are hiring, and this should happen by the first, uh, uh, by the beginning of the fiscal year, a law enforcement officer solely focused on um, investigations for violations of the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. And um, that's an important facet of this. We are committed to work with Coeric, the EWC, the affected tribes, uh, the local native corporations to continue outreach for this um, uh, important topic to make sure we educate folks in the lower 48 that this is a valid, sustainable, um, important culturally, spiritually to Alaska's first people. And we laud Senator Sullivan's efforts. I think we're still working on Facebook, right? So they can sell. Almost, sir? All right. Uh, so anything we can do um, uh, to help, and I'm here to answer questions. I'll um, hang out after the fact. But thank you very much, Melanie, for your leadership, and thank you, Megan, for setting this up. Next, I'd like to invite Dr. Peter Thomas, who's the Executive Di Director of the Marine Mammal Commission, to come up and um, share his perspective with you. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. I'm really pleased to be here with Perry, Sylvester, Ben, and Steve. Thank you. Um, and particularly with Vera Metcalf, the, es the Director of the Eskimo Walrus Commission who is also a special advisor on Native Affairs to our Marine Mammal Commission. We really be, appreciate the chance to be here for this briefing by the leaders and artists uh, as you share your way of life in the Arctic and your relationships with walrus and ivory carving. And I'm here to really reinforce the message of this briefing. The Marine Mammal Commission is an independent federal agency charged by the Marine Mammal Protection Act with furthering the conservation of marine mammals and their environment. We work to ensure that marine mammal populations are restored to and maintained as significant functioning elements of healthy marine ecosystems, and providing science-based oversight of domestic and international policies under the, the Act. Now, I think the main point of this hearing is that the 
while the Marine Mammal Protection Act generally prohibits the taking of marine mammals, it exempts certain activities from that prohibition, including taking by Alaska Natives for purposes of subsistence or creating and selling authentic Native articles of handicrafts and clothing, providing the taking is not accomplished in a, ma in a wasteful manner. I think that's the main message we want to get across at this session. Now, in support of that, Section 119 of the Marine Mammal Protection Act in 1994 gave explicit authority to the National Marine Fisheries Service and Fish and Wildlife Service to enter into cooperative agreements with Alaska Native organizations, such as the Eskimo Walrus Commission, to conserve marine mammals and provide for co-management of subsistence use by Alaska Natives. The Commission supports co-management as an effective means to promote the conservation of marine mammals in a region where they are of critical cultural, ecological, social, nutritional, and economic importance to Alaska Natives. The Commission held listening sessions in 2016 to hear from the people in several communities about issues related to marine mammals, including environmental changes, changes in the, the availability of marine mammals, and other general concerns, such as food security, increasing vessel traffic, and the need for improved consultation and communication with Alaska, between Alaska Native communities and federal agencies on actions affecting subsistence uses of marine mammals. Based on what we heard at those listening sessions, we initiated our own, uh, really at the indigenous, sorry, the encouragement of the Indigenous Peoples Council for Marine Mammals we undertook a case study-based study of co-management, building on a previous review we'd done in 2008. So we were really looking to say, you know, how's it working? What are the characteristics, what's happening that may stand in the way of effective co-management? And what are sort of recommendations that a group can make to, to really further co-management? This review was conducted by a Canal Sea Grant fellow, Jenna Malik and Vicki Cornish, who's here in the room. And it's wrapping up now, and it really benefited from a steering committee of Alaska Native leaders, including Vera, uh, as well as the federal uh, representatives from Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service really invested with co-management. I won't go into great detail, but I'll just say that the Alaska Eskimo Walrus Commission was one of the case studies, along with the Aleut Community of St. Paul and the Aleut Marine Mammal Commission. And we won't go into all the details, but we'll be putting out a report really in the next couple of weeks, sort of detailing key elements of effective co-management, what the partners of co-management expect of one another, uh, how to improve communication, uh, the sort of question of leadership training and transition as younger folks come along, how do we maintain the strength of our communities and the co-management relationship? So we're here to facilitate further discussions on co-management as really requested by co-management partners. And we'll have a fact sheet in the back summarizing some of the initial findings of that report. And the report will be out in a few weeks. So we're really committed still to working with the Eskimo Walrus Commission and another, other Alaska Native organizations, government agencies, and other stakeholders to further the purposes of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And so we really are glad to be here to talk about the provisions for the protection of Alaska Natives whose livelihoods may be adversely affected by actions taken under the Act. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Um, we had listed Carol Brown, who's a senior counselor with the Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs Office um, on our program, but she's here. Um, if you have any questions for her, Carol, can you raise your hand? There you go. Okay, that's Carol right there. So after um, our event, maybe at the reception, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask in terms of um, the Indian Affairs Department and what their perspective is on walrus ivory and Alaska Natives' ability to harvest walrus and to make use of the ivory as art. She'll be available. I'm going to go ahead and open this up to questions um, from the audience. Um, you've been very patient and um, 
good listeners. Thank you. Um, we're going to have about half an hour um, for any questions that you might have of us. So, anybody? Earlier, I used the analogy of music and art, but Leon uh, brings up an important point, which is the economic security aspect of walrus ivory and what that means for our families. We harvest the walrus as a food source, and ivory is a byproduct of it. So we are not harvesting walrus solely to obtain ivory. This is a food source for us. For a lot of us, it is over half of our diet. Um, we rely on the walrus to feed our families, and the ivory is a byproduct of it, and it does provide for some economic security. So I asked you earlier to imagine a world without music, so I'm asking you right now to think of your expertise, your professional job, what you do for a living, and if your paycheck was taken away from you and your profession was banned, and you're, you know, you're each experts in something. Everybody in this room has some kind of a specialty, and you generate an income off of that. So imagine if your ability to provide for your family was taken away from you and you were criminalized um, by trying to provide some economic security for your family. Any other questions? Well, it sounds like Carol's asking you to explain a little bit um, the cost of living issue in our communities. And um, Perry, do you want to tackle that question in terms of how much it costs, why it costs so much, like groceries and um, gas? And Yeah. For a piece of steak at the store, it's like $53. And that's equivalent to 12 gallons of fuel. So we, the choice is simple. We're going to get gas instead of getting a steak because the walrus taste better. It does. You know, people say, why don't you just go buy steak? Why don't you buy chicken? Um, the cost is prohibitive. But also, our food, we have a different kind of a relationship to our food and the harvesting of it and the preparation of it than you do when you eat sit down and have your hamburger or your tofu burger. Um, the other analogy I'll make is for people who practice religion um, and take communion in, that is how our native foods are for us. It's not just calories and carbs and um, the ingredient list. It's like us, for us, it's taking communion. When I eat walrus, I know that my brothers and my uncles have risked their lives to go out in a little tiny aluminum boat in the big Bering Sea in order to be able to provide for our family. I know who's touched my food. I know that it is free range, organic. <laughs> um, I know that the women in our family um, made sure that it was clean and put away properly. And when we sit together, I don't eat it on an individual plate. We sit around a tray and we eat as a family. Um, another example of how it's different for us is when our men are out boating and hunting and risking their lives for us, we don't eat dinner until they come home because that's our way of honoring, knowing that they're risking their lives out there for us. So once our men come home, then everybody can sit down together and we eat. We're very communal that way. Um, our society works that way. It's not so much about individual rights. Um, we rely on each other to survive in the harshest environment in the world, and we have for thousands of years. And we are not hunting walrus just for the sake of ivory. It is our food source. It is our spiritual um, connection to our ancestors. And it's beautiful art, and it shouldn't be banned. Um, so thank you, Carol, for bringing that point home, is why don't you just eat, go, go buy your groceries from the store. Or another one that we get is, why don't you just move to the city? Well, I, I do believe that our Alaska Native cultures are unique, and imagine if there was no Italian culture all of a sudden one day. Um, you know, a lot of people immigrate to the United States, but their home countries are still there. You can still learn how to speak Italian. They can still move back. If you've got Italian roots and you want to go and learn your culture and be part of that, you have that option. But if all of us Alaska Natives just move out, that will be the extinction of a distinct culture, a distinct group of people. So that's not an option for us either. Um, 
Does anybody else have any questions or comments? The, you know, the concerns that we hear are, well, we're trying to save the elephant population and, you know, eliminate poaching, and that's why we need to eliminate the market for elephant ivory. But if you look here, they're very distinct from each other. Walrus ivory. This is walrus ivory right here. When you cut it, when you cut this tusk, this is what it looks like in there. This is elephant ivory. So even for an untrained person, you can tell the difference between those two. There's, there should be no confusion about if you're looking at a piece of art, is this elephant ivory or is this walrus ivory? It's very clearly distinguishable. And the other question is, well, what if, um, what's going to happen if um, it isn't made illegal? It hasn't been made illegal for hundreds of years and the population is healthy. Uh, I mentioned that we harvest walrus not just for the ivory, it's a byproduct of the animal. It's currently legal in 44 states. We haven't gone haywire. We're not out harvesting walrus just to make millions of dollars. I don't know a single artist who is a millionaire from carving this artwork. It's typically our artists are um, hand to mouth and if you're able to sell some of your artwork then you're able to buy more gas or ammunition and go harvest more walrus to feed your family. Um, I do believe that the laws that have been enacted in the six states that banned it were well-intentioned, but like Senator Sullivan said, misinformed, misguided. I don't think that a single Alaska Native artist was consulted when the legislation was enacted in these various states. Nobody called on us to ask our opinion. Um, the six states have simply just banned it. And we don't want to see it expand into other states. We'd like to see the six states reverse um, their position on this. We're not harvesting for poaching purposes, like I said. Um, this is our, our way of life. It's who we are. It's the fabric of our society to provide for one another. And uh, ivory represents our art, our culture, our history, um, our ancestors carved it as tools. It, it was utilitarian. Um, before we had um, Barbie dolls, we made our own dolls for our children out of walrus ivory. It's intricately tied into who we are as Alaska Native people. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments? I'm so grateful that you all came to listen to us and I hope that you leave here more informed and if you're able to be an ambassador for this, we would really appreciate. We need allies, we need allies in this. Um, it can't just be Alaska Natives who are um, trying to educate others. So if you've learned anything from today, I ask you the next time you're having, you know, dinner or conversation with anybody to help inform them and help promote our art. Um, not only are we dealing with the legal issues, but there's societal norms that are changing. Um, we've brought in artists from our um, various villages when we do have tourists in our region and the f expression of disgust on a tourist's face when they realize that what they're holding is made from walrus, and yet they're walking in with leather shoes, is ironic. Um, there's not just the legal issues, but we're battling the social norms around it and having to educate. And for those of you who came and listened to our panelists and um, watched our video and PowerPoint, I hope that you're able to walk out of here as allies for us, because we really need you. We need everybody. Um, all hands on deck to help us with this issue.